about this one. Basically. Yeah, buddy, like you and I have never done this one before. Okay, our next technique is an extremely aggressive technique. It's called Mace of Aggression, properly named. Um, this one we're going to utilize what we call borrowed force. The person's pulling us in with two hands, and we're going to borrow his force and use it against him. The harder he pulls us, the more it's going to hurt him. It's that simple. Um, in this technique, because you're being pulled forward and you're borrowing his force, you have to step forward. I've seen a technique done where you kick the leg out. I personally don't like that version of the technique. I've never been real fond of it. But uh, in Mr. Parker's era, they used to wear these boots where they kind of came halfway up the ankle. And if I could see Mr. Parker kicking that guy's leg out and catching him with mace of aggression, and I could really see the explosiveness of why he liked it that way. Uh, remember, Kempo is an art that is tailored to fit the individual. You do not have to fit the art. The art fits you. So therefore, I prefer a leg check when I do the move, and I'll show both ways when we're doing it with the help of Mr. Martin over here. Okay, Mr. Chad, come over here and let's do the grab from this angle real slow. Uh, he, he's grabbing me with two hands. As he pulls forward, my left hand's coming over at the same time I'm getting a leg check and striking the face, creating that zone of obscurity. Pull back up. If he grabs and it's a taller person, <laughs> you can kind of pick this arm up on the way and get an arm break. Chad and I are about the same height. It's not going to be real easy to pick the arm up and get an arm break, but if I still hit his arm, it's going to spring load my right hand. So it's going to actually put more torque on the shot to the temple that's going to rake the eye socket and the bridge of the nose. So I do like to pick that arm up on the way with my elbow. Uh, whether I get to break it or I don't makes no difference, but I do like to try and do that when I do the move. My left hand is going to come over top, trapping the hand so he doesn't have the option of striking me in the face anymore. So with that motion, pause for one second. Uh, my left hand's coming up and my right hand's doing this when he's pulling me. So I'm not going backward to go forward to hit him. I'm raising my hand up to come down. I'm timing it with my right foot coming down so I'm getting a marriage of gravity effect along with the idea of him pulling forward. So between the two compounded principles, this is going to give us what we call directional harmony in our motion. So as he pulls forward, my right hand comes up with the motion of my left hand coming up. Kind of like I'm bringing my hand up on the wrong side of my body to say the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, so as I bring my hand up, wah, I come right across his face and I've created that zone of obscurity. At this point, he's going to want to grab his face real bad and I've got his hands trapped. So I'm going to borrow that idea of him wanting to grab and clear his hands down, strike, strike with my elbow. At that point, I'm going to cover out once again, showing a real good counterbalance as I step. So as he pulls forward, I bring my hands up and I strike his face. I roll him in, strike with the elbow, load it and shoot the outward elbow, bring my hands up, cover out. Real, real simple idea. Keep the hands up. Doesn't matter who it is, male, female, good fighter always keeps their hands up unless you're trying to bait someone in. In this technique, the person's already fooled you. No reason to be baiting, they're already there. Keep your hands up when you're leaving. As he's pulling me forward, I trap and strike right across the face. If you notice and you look down, he can't kick me in the groin. I can also use that to bring his head forward into the fist. So I'm borrowing that idea also, which is going to give me colliding forces on his face. This is raking, coming right across that eye socket and taking this bridge of the nose. At this point, that's why I said he's going to want to grab real bad. And I say, no, you're not. And then I'm going to cover out. It's the idea of you burned your hand on a stove and you want to grab what's burnt and then someone doesn't let you. But this time what burns is your face and the guy doesn't let you grab your face. One more time, real slow. He grabs. I trap and strike, getting a good leg check, bringing him in, caught him with the elbow. If his head's back real far from the shot of the elbow, it looks like you can't reach him. Sure you can. You just got to bounce off of his arm. And then if he's still there, this can claw as you would go to leave on your counterbalance. One more time. Pulls me in. 
Strikes, clears, hits, hits, and covers. One more time. When he pulls me in, watch how I'm utilizing the leg check. One more time. Good. Back up. And one more time, let's take it from a different angle. Real soft. He pulls me in. I hit. Bring his hands in, caught him. Catch the arm, caught him. As I go to leave, if he's still there, have a sweep on the foot if you need it because your foot's right up against his leg check. One of the things we haven't talked about, turn this way, sir, is when this hits the leg, look at the impact what's happening here in the leg. Now imagine him pulling you in real aggressively with that strike right there with your foot just coming in right into that leg. So as he pulls me forward, we hit, brings him in, caught, caught, out. So you're catching him with both the shots on the elbows. Bam, bam. Once you hit it once, it's unfortified and it drops. When you're catching it again with the elbow, it's going to do an incredible amount of damage. One more time. Hits, brings him in, caught, slips through, catches on the other side of that jaw. Now as I go to leave, I put the hand in his face and I've got the sweep. Now one more time, let's take it a little bit faster. Let's take it from this direction. Thank you, Chad. And once real slow to this direction. One, two, three, four, and don't forget to put your hands up. Thank you. It's gonna be like that. Okay, you make it look. Okay, our ninth technique is attacking mace. This is written against a right step through punch. When I practice techniques that are for a right step through punch, I do practice them off the backhand and then I practice them off the lead hand. Uh, we're going to demonstrate for you in just one minute. This is, like I said, against the right step through punch. So as the punch is coming at me, I'm still creating distance, I'm limiting my target areas. I'm stabilizing my base, blocking with my lead hand, and then I use my backup hand, punching him right into the rib cage. At this point, ideally, he goes backward. My hand comes over with a waiter's hand, slides right down the wrist. As I grab, it's like I'm pulling him back into the roundhouse kick, and then I'm delivering a punch right to the kidney area. At this point, even though I've got a hold of his wrist, he might slide out, fall to the ground. If he didn't, I'll heel palm and check his shoulder which you put him to the ground as I'm sweeping his foot, covering out to my zone of sanctuary. Mr. Chad, come out here and we'll show this one now with your help. Okay, Mr. Chad's in a left neutral bow. He's going to do a right step through punch slowly. I create distance, limiting my target areas, stabilizing my base. At this point, I punch him right in the rib cage. I come over top with my waiter's hand. I say, hey, you come back here. Roundhouse kick, give my leg check, blast to the kidney, and cover out. Come on back up, Let's take it from another angle. Once again, uh, now it's still step through. Mr. Chad does the right step through. I created distance, punch to the, kick, the rib cage, come over top with my waiter's hand. If his head's in there too close, I can do an eye slice, pull down, roundhouse kick, get my leg checked, deliver my punch right to the kidney area, and cover out. Come on back up. And back over here, Mr. Chad. This time when we do it, right neutral bow, sir. Stay right there. If the guy was standing here shuffling, show the punch. Good. That's much more dangerous. A person fighting like that. Why? Kemper principles come into play. Quickest way from one point to another is a straight line. This is where the opponent is. This is where he wants to come. So that's where he's looking to go. That's the quickest way from point A to point B. If the person's right-handed, then his lead hand's in front. That's real dangerous. That's kind of the way a Kempo man thinks. If it's a boxer, he's setting up with a jab, which means he's probably a southpaw. That means he's left-handed and he keeps his power hand back, where he's trying to mimic what he's seen on TV, which is boxing, and then shoot this left at you. So we're going to take that idea right out of the way immediately. We're going we're to just ruin his day right off the bat. 
and they could not test his skill, speed, or strength by creating the zone of obscurity. As he wants to take this punch and basically run it right into my face, actually probably about six inches back here through my face, I'm going to let him punch what we call it the ghost image. So he shoots his punch, boom, and he gets hit right in the face, right in the kisser there. One more time. He shoots his punch, boom, right into the face. Now I'm basically what I'm doing is, is his punch is coming, out, coming at me, I'm here. But then as I move my back foot, I'm now here, and now I've got the angle of entry right in here on his center line. If you notice, when he gets hit, he can't see. He's going to want to grab his face. That's when I go to the rib cage. Come over top, roundhouse kick, and finish the technique the same way you started. Come on back up. Let's take it a little bit faster. He shoots his punch. Come on back up. From this direction, sir. He shoots his punch. Thank you. Time. Come on up, Mr. Chad. Let's take it from over here one more time. Real slow for me this time, I want to talk about cause and effect. Sure. As he's shooting his punch, right here, I've created that zone of obscurity and hit him in the temple or the eye socket. He's definitely going to want to grab his face. As he grabs his face, I want to affect his breathing. So as I hit him in the ribs, I'm breaking a rib, trying to drive that rib into his lung. This is going to come over with a waiter's hand, possibly slicing the eye, coming down the wrist, pulling him into that kick to the groin, getting that leg check, trying to break that leg there with a leg check. As I glue this to the hip, boom, I do my punch to the kidney area. Right there, he has no idea if I want to continue fighting what would be coming. And I just say, show mercy and leave. Come on back up, sir. Thank you. Okay, for our 10th commandment of Kempo, sword and hammer. Uh, definitely named properly. This technique is very easy move, and I always like to say uh, the easy moves are what seem to work in the heat of battle, especially when fear takes over. A lot of times people don't like to talk about fear, but fear can fuel you too. When, when you're fearing for your life or someone that you care about, other things don't, don't come into play other than getting the job done if you train properly. This person's grabbing me from a zone of obscurity on my shoulder meaning from a flank. As he grabs, I'm going to trap the hand on the shoulder, and I don't want to take the long way around the mountain when I go to bring my hand to my shoulder. It's just right up my hands, tracking my own body. As that's happening, my right foot's going to be stepping to the person's center line, and as my left hand's coming up here to my shoulder, my right hand's going to be traveling up to his throat. So both hands are making the same motion. My right foot like I said, we'll be stepping to a center line and I'm going to be dropping my height, so I'm settling in my stance. This way I'm going to get a reverse marriage of gravity effect, which is going to cause uh, him to lift his head from the shot to the throat because I'm dropping low. So when I drop, boom, I'm hitting upward to make him not be able to see me at the same time affect his breathing. So I'm getting two things for one shot. That's economy of motion when you get two for one. At this point, my right hand, whether he's grabbing his throat or he doesn't grab his throat, if he's grabbing his throat, I'm moving his hands away from his throat. So once again, I'm not grab, letting him grab the other hand as if he burned it on a stove. In this case, it's his throat, so he's not going to be allowed to grab his throat. As he's not allowed to grab his throat, I hammer the groin, and then my right hand is going to come up and it'll clear his face if his face is in the way, or if nothing's in the way, then I'm just covering my center line as I cover out to my zone of sanctuary. Well, now here, Mr. Chad, give me a hand with this one. He's taking his left hand, he's grabbing my shoulder, and he's pulling me. And you can see what he wants to do. He wants to pull me into that fist. So as he's pulling me into the fist, first of all, this hand coming up does help to shield the face, but the main thing it's doing is trapping this hand because this hand can hit me too. Now, everyone sees this one, but I'm more concerned about this one because that's closest to my what? My hard drive. I don't want to get the hard drive shut down. 
So as he's pulling, I'm trapping and striking up into his throat. As this hits him in the throat, that right hand's now canceled, and I don't want to let him grab as I hammer to the groin. Like I said, my hand can come up and hit the face and clear that arm as I go to leave. One more time. He grabs the shoulder and pop, and out. One more time. He grabs, so we hit to the throat, boom, hammer to the groin, and cover. Come on back up. Let's take it from the side. Here. Real slow, he pulls. I bar that and strike to the throat. So I'm utilizing the barring force. I move his hand away and I hammer to the groin. Clear, take the eyes, create, continuing to create that zone of obscurity, clearing the arm and covering out. One more time, Mr. Chet. And cover. Good, come on back up. One more time for this direction. Thank you, sir. Now, I'm going to come back. The idea of when he grabs and I hit him in the throat, this is crushing his esophagus. This is shattering his jaw, possibly making him bite on his own tongue, choke on his blood, having a real bad day. As this is he's hit here, he wants to grab that. I say, no, you're not grabbing that. And pop! That'll keep him from reproducing another like him. This is coming up, taking the eyes. And as I take this hand, I can always continue to go back to something else that we know from the yellow belt chart. And then cover up. Thank you, Mr. Chad. This completes our yellow belt chart. Um, I hope all of you had fun. Uh, I hope you continue to train hard, train regularly, train intelligently, and not make any excuses about your training. Uh, I'd like to say the yellow belt pledge for you or the creed for the Kempo system. I come to you with only karate, empty hands. I have no weapons. Should I be forced to defend myself? My principles are my honor. Should it be a matter of life or death, right or wrong, then here are my weapons, karate, my empty hands. Ed Parker. Our next technique is obscure sword. Uh, the technique is properly named. Our opponent is coming from a flank, meaning an obscure zone, and the sword is going to run obscure to his body, so it would be very hard to deflect. Once that happens in the technique, as the man grabs his throat, his head is also going to move upward, which is going to obscure the kick, uh, which we'll demonstrate for you now with the help of my assistant here, Mr. Davis. Okay. The person is grabbing on the shoulder here with the left hand. As he does it, he pushes you forward. Once again, you're trapping the hand because the quickest way from one point to another is a straight line. It wouldn't take much for the guy to pop you in the jaw right there. So you want to check this hand off. When I say check it off, it doesn't mean that he can't pull his hand out. Okay? So all you're doing is preventing this from being able to strike in the face and manipulate your body. Your left foot is solidifying your base when you step forward. And I'm stepping so I'm going to be splitting him in half. Basically, I'm putting him in the horse stance. We started out, he's at the fourth step of range, which is manipulation. He can manipulate my body, and he's at an obscure zone, so I can't see him coming. So as he pushes me forward, I solidify my base, check this hand off. I've loaded my right hand at this point. I'm going to borrow his energy as he's pulling me into his punch. He's not going to be able to get the punch there because I'm going to split him right up the center line and let this travel up his obscure zone. At this point, I'm going to turn my left hip, turning my body so I get torque in my kick and shoot my kick right to his groin and then cover out to his zone of sanctuary. Go back up, Mr. Davis. Once again, he grabs, pushes forward, solidifies, oh. chops, oh. kicks, and covers. Come on back up. Let's take it from a different angle. Once again, he pushes forward, solidifies, bar the force, chops, kicks the groin, and then covers. Back up. One more time. And again. Back up. And once again. Slow. Solidify, load the right hand, borrow his force, kick to the groin. One more time, please. Back up. 
Thank you, sir. Uh, actually, don't leave us yet. One more thing I want to talk about. Let's turn this way. Good train horse for me. When the chop hits and it runs this way and it hits his throat, you want to make sure that the guy's vision is obscured. So you're striking. Even if I struck in, you can see where his head's coming. If you're off on your shot, you could stay in the fight. So when I strike, I want it to run up when I hit. Just like we did in Sword and Hammer on number 10 in the yellow belt chart. So we're kind of borrowing that idea once again. So as the chop hits, let it run obscure. This should make his hands come up, because since you crushed the esophagus, the groin's wide open at that point. Uh, thank you, Mr. Davis. I'm going to demonstrate it once in the air. I push forward. The hand is loaded. I bar the force chop. Kick to the groin and cover. Thank you. Yeah, there you go. End up in the Next technique is raining claw. Claw coming from overhead in the technique, thus named raining claw. It's against the right uppercut. It's number 23 on the orange belt chart. Uh, this is one that's a real fast technique. It has a lot of different types of application. I'm going to show you two ways of doing it uh, with the help of Mr. Davis. In this one, I like to think of kind of like, some people like to start the technique from a uh, standing still position. I firmly believe you should be able to do the technique from standing still or already in a fighting position. If I'm standing still and he's shooting the punch, I'm going to create distance and block. So my left hand is creating the zone of obscurity. As this is going to slide down the arm, causing frictional pull to draw his head forward, I'm going to borrow the leg check to help bring his head into the punch. This, when I'm clawing here, I'm trying to tear the flesh from the face and down the arm. When I'm done the technique, if I were doing it for real, I would have to dig the person's flesh out from in between my fingernails. That's how excessive the claw is. You really have to back off the claw when you're practicing it with your partner so you don't hurt them. It's very easy to tear the retina of the eye, get your thumb caught in his eye. So you have to back off the claw when you're practicing it. Like I said uh, in the previous technique, safety. You have to be really careful when you're doing this. You can really hurt somebody with this. The person's giving you their body and letting you practice a, a life-threatening technique on their body so you don't want to take advantage of it and hurt them. So you have to be real careful when you're doing it. I recommend you do a technique over and over and over again, slowly building on the st speed, going through the embryonic stages of motion, which is compared to a child crawling, and then the mechanical stages of motion, which would be compared to walking, and then the spontaneous stages of motion, which would be compared to running. So you should do the technique slow, medium, and then fast. So as he's shooting the, technique, the punch again, once again, I create a distance, and I'm causing the arm basically to move in a circular motion like this. So it's dipping his punch out of the way, which opens up his center line for me to do the uppercut. In other words, he wanted to do the uppercut to me. And it's kind of like Mr. Parker. He had a cool sense of humor. It's like uh, he's going to do on to you, but do it first. So he's going to do the uppercut here instead. By doing the dipping of the elbow, he gets to do the uppercut instead of the opponent doing the uppercut to you. The claw creates the zone of obscurity. Now, as he's shooting it, once again, I said it's a circle, basically moving like this, and he's punching with a circle going this way. So one circle's cutting the other circle. Once again, he shoots the punch. So I dip and claw. He should want to grab his face with the left hand. At that point, I'm going to utilize my leg check as I bring him into the punch. Uh, at that point, you can see I have a whole new set of targets if I want to continue fighting, but we're just going to stomp and go. Come on back up. Once again, he shoots the punch, and I dip the elbow, claw, shoot the, back, the vertical back with the punch to the hinge of the jaw, turning his face away, letting this slide down the arm, and then cover. One more time. Now, when I do the move, I also would like to utilize a back fist instead of the, the punch. So I like to claw it, shoot the back fist, which to me is much more appealing. Uh, when the back fist tracks the arm, it hits right behind the hinge of the jaw. That turns his head and kind of causes the jaw to shift. So that's what I, the way I like to do the technique. I learned it this way and it just seems that it 
fits my body better with the back fist. So, one more time. If I'm already in the fighting position, especially black ball back fist, works real well. One more time. Locked, clawed, tracked, let it cut the uh, arm with my claw, utilizing the elastic recoil, which is real popular in Kemba. You can see how at this point, his width and height and depth is all checked off. And then I'm gonna cover to his own sanctuary, once again from this direction. He shoots his punch, locked, clawed, Shot the back fist. Come on back up. Once again, real slow. So I dip the elbow. There's the dipping of the circle, cutting the circle. The claw with the dipping of the circle. I'm going to shoot the vertical back knuckle tracking into the jaw. That's how it's written. That's how it was taught to me. I prefer, once again, the claw and then the back fist. One more time. So if I'm already in the fighting stance and the punch is thrown, the block with the claw, that stops his uh, forward momentum. My arm's going to track his arm and catch with the back fist and then cover. Once more. And from a different direction. And from the front. This way. Thank you, Mr. Davis. The punch is thrown, dipped, clawed, shot the punch, covered. If you prefer the back fist block, and cover. This direction, and then to this direction. This direction. Okay, our next technique is the last technique on the orange belt chart, number 24. Crashing wings for a rear bear hug, and your arms are free. And it's a low bear hug around your waist. I always refer to it as the big guy, little guy technique. So we have the perfect big guy tonight for that. Mr. Davis, come on back out. Okay. Uh, I gave Mr. Davis the nickname the Gentle Giant. I think he's appropriately named that. Around the karate school, uh, everyone looks up to him because of his kindness and the way that he helps people. But tonight, uh, his kindness and his help is, is not going to save him from the wrath of crashing wings. So here we are. We're being grabbed in this technique around the waist. At that point, once I'm grabbed, the first thing I'm doing is obviously lowering my center of gravity. I'm putting my buttocks right on his thigh. In real life, I would be striking him with my head, which would help to kind of take off some of his momentum of pushing forward, that kind of thing. So as he's struck, I cat over. And also, I'm keeping his face turned away with my head, pressing against him. I've got his arms checked off. Mr. Davis, pull your arms out. At that point, I borrow that to step around his leg, and I'm taking his base away from him at that point. At this point, I borrow that some more as he's pulling, and I elbow him right under the jaw. And I'm going to check that hand off and make him lean back. I'm going to raise this hand up by my ear. Reach around my face, Chris. To check him off so he can't reach around my face and grab my eyes. As, he's, as I'm breaking his horizon, he's going to start to fall. He can't defy gravity. At that point, in Kempo, we like to be kind to our opponent. And I'm going to accelerate his fall. And then I'm going to cover out to my zone of sanctuary. Let's talk about what's going on in there a little bit more. As I'm grabbed... The impact of the headbutt striking him into this part of the face, if the headbutt comes down on the bridge of the nose, causes the eyes to tear up, blood to come out of the nostrils. It's very tough to fight because your vision is obscured just alone from the tears coming out of your eyes. At that point, if we just take all the strikes out of it and I sit, pick me up, Chris, it's very difficult for Mr. Davis to pick me up because of I've lowered my center of gravity. So by just dropping, that already makes it hard for the person to manipulate you. Uh, my arms are coming out and striking down on his. That's where it got its name, crashing wings. Your wings are crashing down on your opponent's arms. And you're striking very tender areas of the arm, I guess you could say, right in here, the nerve centers as he grabs 
elbows go right on it, head butt hits. I'm going to trash the hands up so he can't use them. I'm in a position to stomp on the foot with my heel here and break the metatarsal. I bypass that and slip right around and I use my knee to break his horizon down right back here. If you can see that, get a close in shot on that. I borrow his force and I'm striking him under the jaw to cause his vision. Also, he's looking up. He can't see me at that point and he's been hit right in the jaw. My hands protect me. I've raised my hammer up to come down on his bladder area as I make his body kick up into the hammer and then cover up. Come on, Mr. Davis. Let's do it to another angle. He grabs through the elbows, chat over, headbutt's available, slip around the leg, elbow to the jaw, make him lean, cover out. Once more, from this angle. And let's talk about a what if to the technique. We have ideal phase in which we learn the techniques. The second phase is the what if phase. The more answers you have to your what ifs brings you to your formulation phase. You formulate what would really happen. When someone, the size differential, when they begin to feel the resistance in the technique, they could possibly be trying to push you forward to push you onto your face. Once they felt resistance this way or this way and they can't manipulate you, they're probably going to try and go forward. We're going to take that idea for a minute and go with that. So I get to here and bottom line. And now I've got him. Come on back up. Once more. That's for a rear bear hug. Okay, our first technique is clutching feathers on the orange belt chart. Feathers representing hair. You're having your hair grab and guys are trying to punch you or manipulate you into a very bad situation. Uh, Technique uh, definitely works off a lot of ideas of zones of obscurity. It still creates distance, stabilizes the base, tracks the arm, frictional pull down the arm, launching off the back foot into a forward bow, delivering the heel palm, and then we're going to strike across the person's face with the right hand. And then you're going to cover out to approximately 7.30. With the help of Mr. Davis, we'll go through this some more in depth. Okay, in clutching feathers, the guy's grabbing the hair, and as he's getting, he's getting a good firm grip on your hair. So as, I, as my hand comes up, I'm also trying to shield myself from the other hand. You can get a close-up here on the camera. I'm utilizing this type of wrist lock on the wrist as I'm doing it, which is off of a manipulation type of move that other systems use. Mr. Parker definitely looked at other systems and what they did and what he felt was useful and tried to utilize that type of thing. This is a wrist lock that you see in Aikido. Kemp, uh, Kempos use it, Chin, all different types of systems, Hapkido. And it's a, it's a popular wrist lock. When, I'm, when, the, when my hair is grabbed and I trap that hand, I'm, I'm coming up and I'm striking that hand as I grab. And I'm stepping back with my left foot, solidifying my base. And just that motion alone is taking him up on his toes and uh, making it very difficult for him to move in to hit me. He would have to bend his elbow to be able to reach me with the other hand. So as I'm going back to keep this arm from being able to bend, I'm going to track his arm to the target, which is in the armpit, striking with a middle knuckle strike, definitely doing some nerve damage there, trying to get on the opponent's nerves. 
So as I'm grabbing, I'm stepping back, boom, this is striking right in there. And this is going to track right down the arm, frictional pull, turning him into the heel pump, striking into the face. At this point, I'm going to take my right hand and strike across the face. And then cover out to his own sanctuary. Come on back up, Mr. Davis. Let's do it from a different angle. So I'm grabbed, I step back, middle knuckle is delivered. Vertical block into the extended outward block, tracking the arm, delivering the heel pound. And then I'm going to strike right across the face and cover out. Come on back up. Once again, let's take it from a slightly different angle, real slow. So I'm grabbing, I step back, middle knuckle, come right up, heel pound, and strike across the face. Once again, another angle. Step back, middle knuckle strike. Again, this is keeping him checked off by striking right up here into the armpit by, by eliminating this arm over here. He's not able to hit me with this hand. I'm trying to turn his body sideways. If he's square to me and I don't move him sideways, actually turn this way, this arm can reach me and I've got a real problem. So. Creating distance, limiting the target, target areas, and you're still stabilizing the base. So, you know, you're always trying to stabilize your base and have a good foundation so you can stay on your feet so you have flight available if all things fail and go wrong. There's never any guarantees. So he grabs, middle knuckle, clears, strikes, and covers. Thank you, sir. Next technique is triggered salute on the orange belt chart. Um, this one, the salute is a heel palm. Salute in Kempo means heel palm. Uh, the heel palm is triggered by the person's push. Um, <clears throat> at the very beginning of the technique, unlike the others that we had talked about uh, previous, was creating distance and clutching feathers. Well, this one's going to go forward. The first move is still just like, in my opinion, clutching feathers. Clutching feathers traps and creates distance and uses the right hand. Triggered salute traps and advances and uses the right hand. Continues into a crane and flaps the elbow, drives the elbow into the ribs, back knuckles, shoots a vertical back knuckle thrust punch to the chin, and then covers out. Uh, with the help of Mr. Davis coming out here, sir, we're going to go over triggered salute. The guy's doing the push right off the bat as he pushes, but leg check stops his forward momentum right off the bat. My heel palm's tracking his body. If it's shooting straight in, he can parry my heel palm and then put me in harm's way. But if my heel palm's tracking the body, hits the chin, drives my fingertips into the eyes, circle in a figure eight motion, craning that arm, I'm gonna flap my elbow, keeping him in front of me, not off to a flank, and I'm gonna drive my elbow into the ribs, back knuckle across the kidney and shoot the punch right to the chin. At this point I'm going to check this arm and cover out to a zone of sanctuary. Come on back up sir. Let's do that again from another angle. Once again he comes in for the push. This stops the, uh, his forward momentum with the leg check and this push triggers the salute so the heel palm hits him under the chin. At this point he would probably grab my hand which if I draw my hand back this way I'm pulling him on top of me, so that doesn't make any sense. I want to continue my motion in a circle and round off the corner and flat my elbow into his ribs. Driving my elbow straight into the rib, trying to puncture this lung. I'm then going to back him up with the kidney and whip that into his kidney and shoot this punch right to the jaw. Once that hits the jaw, I'm going to get out of dies and get rid of this arm, putting him at a zone of obscurity if I wanted to continue fighting or leave and cause some damage. Going back up, sir. Let's take it from another angle. Uh, actually, right over here. Okay, so as he's coming in to push, I move in, boom, stopping, crane, elbow, elbow, back knuckle, and punch, get rid of that arm. Coming back up. Once again from another angle. Stop, stand here for me. Right there. When he's pushing, 
get a close up of the leg check. This leg check will probably end the fight right there because you're taking his base away. This also, when a tall guy brings his head, once again push, into the heel pump. That's going to cause a lot of damage. You're going to get colliding forces on this shot and this shot here. Once this happens, the fingers go into the eyes. I've got a real good zone of obscurity at this point. I'm going to claw and take everything I can on the way on that eight path. At this point, you can see how it would be hard for him to reach me with the left hand. So I flap, and now I'm going to drive this straight in, tracking the arm, just like he'd clutch the feathers, but instead of a middle knuckle, an elbow shot. Then I'm going to back knuckle it and shoot that punch right in and cover out. Come on back up, sir. Let's take it again a little bit faster. Right? Thank you. Yeah, that's going to be our attack. Um, the first time. Okay. Okay, our next one is a uh, dance of death. <clears throat> this was uh, one of Mr. Parker's favorite techniques. Uh, the technique gets its name through the extension of the technique because you flip the guy over from his back and onto his belly and you more or less dance all over it. Uh, so it is appropriately named. Um, I like to start this technique when I practice it from a fighting stance. So I'm in my fighting stance and the punch is thrown. It's a right shuffle punch like a boxer would like to do. I zone off, block on the center line. I curve it into a punch. You can see the good elephant's trunk in my punch. As he grabs his face, that's the zone of obscurity, I strike to the groin, he grabs his groin. My left hand's going to contour over the shoulder, tracking down into the leg, utilizing frictional pull, I'm going to step through his center line and drive my elbow right into his solar plexus or rib area. From this point, I track the leg, so I put right to my hip, got a knee lock in above his knee, I'm going to back knuckle his other leg and heel pound him in the groin. Check the leg down, stump, track it and cover out to a zone of sanctuary. We're now here, Mr. Chris. Uh, Mr. Davison, on the side for me. We're gonna start this one from a, a fighting position. We're gonna do it slow the first time. So Mr. Chris has his hands up. Uh, like I said, you can already kind of picture like the fight is already in motion. It's already in, in play. As he shoots the punch, I slip it and I block it. And it, I, I let the block cause the punch to come out faster. As, as I pick this arm up right on the center line, I'm cutting him right down the center. I want to make sure I block on the center. Not over here at 3 o'clock, not past his ear, right on his center line, cutting him right down the middle. One more time, sir, shoot that punch. Boom. And he's going to eat that. When he eats that and he grabs his face, we're going to strike to the groin. Mr. Parker used to say, you got to meet it to beat it or you're going to eat it. This is a real good example of that. One more time, he shoots the punch, I meet it, so he eats it. At this point, he's grabbing his face, the zone of obscurity is created. I strike to the groin, he grabs his groin. My left hand follows right over into his leg as I do the inward elbow, picking him up, checking that leg, but a back knuckle this one, clearing that out of the way. Strike to the groin. This knee's got this locked in, I can get a break in here if I want, I just want to check it down, stomp, and go. Come on back up, sir. Once again, slow. He shoots the punch. I slip it. He eats it. I strike to the groin. Contour over. I've got a good check right here on his arm. As this comes over into the leg, causing him to go. Back up with heel pump. Check and cover. Leave that down for me. Let's turn this way. Get a close-up shot of this. See, so he's laying here. The legs turn so he can't kick. That's a lot of pain. Right here, the foot's locked in on the leg, so the circle's closed. He can't kick with. Uh, he can kick with the leg, but as he does, it's checked off, and his center line's exposed. When I check this down, this stomps above the kneecap. That's going to cause a lot of damage. This is going to strike the toes. Even if what I did didn't do the job, he won't be able to get back up and come after me. Come on back up, sir. 
One more time, let's take it a little bit faster. He shoots the punch. Back up. One more time over here. A little bit faster. Thank you. Our next technique is thrusting salute. This is against the right front uh, snapping ball kick coming at your midsection. Uh, best way to block in this is to get out of the way so you are creating distance, limiting your target area, stabilizing your base. And then you're going to basically kick, you're going to place the opponent in a horse stance and you're going to be uh, sideways to that person in a neutral bow, limiting your target areas when you're going to deliver the kick and a heel palm. Once again, the technique gets its name from the heel palm, heel palm and kempo, meaning salute. Uh, kick's coming at you, you create distance, target areas are limited, base is stabilized, your lead hand's blocking, your other hand's your back up. You're going to bring your lead hand up, cover yourself as you go to kick the person into the groin, you put them in the horse stance, and then there's your salute, the heel palm. At this point, you're going to cover out the opposite direction of the way that they fall, covering your center line, which, according to the Kempo manuals, is 430. Mr. Davis, come on out here and give me a hand. Mr. Davis is going to be in our left inch row over here. And just demonstrate the kick force in the air, sir. Okay, so the kick is traveling down a linear path at you. So, let's move it a little bit. So as he kicks, I'm getting out of the way. Right? And he's now in a horse stance to me. So I've put the bigger opponent in a horse stance, and now I'm going to cut him right down the center line with the kick. So I kick, he bends forward right into the heel pump. Now you can get a close-up shot here and see how the leg check could bring, also helps to bring his head forward and would also help to knock him down. And then we would cover out to our zone of sanctuary. Now this heel pump that's hitting him in the face, once again slow. When we catch him with this shot, the groin causes the person, whoop, the mouth to when they're hit. As the mouth is open, we're closing it for him with the heel pump. That's going to have a compound effect here because if you catch him with the mouth open, the teeth can shatter. That's a knockout shot. He's definitely going to go over. And the thing is, it's taking him to his third point. That's where he's going to land. Once again, sir, let's take it from a different angle. Mr. Chris throws the kick. And we cover out to our zone of sanctuary. Once again, sir, a little bit faster. Wait. Thank you. Okay, our next one is gift of destruction. Gift is there someone's handing you something, so it's a handshake technique. And gift of destruction. It's a key important to get out of the way and get off the line. Your first move, you're going to check the person's height by pulling downward a motion toward uh, 430. As I step off the 1030, I'm going to deliver my heel palm to his elbow and my knee is going to take the thigh. A lot of people try and put the knee to the groin to bring the guy's head down into the elbow, but it's much better if you hit the thigh. If you hit the groin, sometimes you can make a trade. And a trade in this would be a very bad trade. You don't want to get knee in the groin. So as you're stepping, you pull heel palm and knee, inward elbow, and launch off your back foot and settling into the leg check uh, will also help to bring his head down into the inward elbow. This move is done very quickly. Speed is definitely an essential in this technique. You cannot take a stroll in the park on this technique. Mr. Chris, come out here, give me a hit. So Mr. Chris and I, when we start the technique, I see a lot of guys try and do this as they start totally off-center, and that's not realistic when you shake hands. The idea is this person is using deceit to get close to you so he can hurt you. So he's gotten this close to you to shake your hand so you're square. At this point, you're pulling and stepping off. The knee sends his leg back and the heel palm strikes the elbow. And then I'm going to deliver my inward elbow to his jaw. Once this hits, 
I want to check this arm as I'm covering out to my zone of sanctuary. Come back up here, Mr. Chris. If we look here, as I step and I pull, and the knee goes shooting back, that brings the head down to my height, even on a taller guy. When I'm stepping, I don't want to try and step short because I'm still in the line in his line of sight. I'm trying to move out of his line of sight and past him. So we start out, our center lines are the same. But once I move, my center line is different. And by pulling him, it's hard for him to see me with his left eye, but he can kind of still see me with the right eye. So that's what I mean when I say I'm moving out of his line of sight. So when we're shaking hands on the first move, I step, pull, knee, elbow. At this point, I'm going to cover out. Cut. Okay, so when we're shaking hands, I can feel that the person's either grabbing my hand real aggressively or they're raising the shoulder as they're going to hit me. Some type of body language says that I'm now in danger. So it's a key essential point that I get out of the way. And as I get out of the way, I want to try and utilize two zones. So I want to check his height and I'm moving out of his line of sight. At this point, my heel palm is going to come up, my knee is going to take the leg, and I'm going to check his height and deliver the inward elbow. At this point, I'm covering out to my safe zone. Come back up, sir. Let's take it from a different angle. So where the center lines are lined up, I sense the violent action, I step, knee, catch him with that inward elbow, and then I want to cover out to my safe zone. Once more, take it a little bit faster. And once more, a little bit faster. Another angle. And once again. Thank you, sir. Can we see that one? Sure. Okay, our next technique is locking horns. This is against the front headlock. So the guy has grabbed your head and he's going to try and drive his knee into your face in the technique. Um, in this one, because you're bent over, the fight could have already been in place. Uh, a dozen and a half reasons how you got yourself in this position. But he has a hold of your head and you got a knee traveling rapidly at your face. The first thing you're going to do is you're going to not try and test strength. Your wrist is very small, the person's leg is very big. So you want to move it out of the way by striking in on the thigh with your left hand. And your right hand is going to do an underhand reverse hand sword contouring the person's lower uh, groin area there. So as I'm bent over and I'm pulled forward, I strike into the groin and I borrow the person's force of them pulling forward. And when I do, I step right into their center, solidifying my base as I strike them in their lower groin area there. So I'm pulled over, and uh, he's pulling me into the shot, and I strike. At this point, he bends over, so I use my monkey hand to grab the testicles and crush them. At that point, as he bends forward, I drive my elbow into his solar plexus, up into his chin, my left hand shielding my face. I'm going to use a push down to bring his head forward. I'm going to strike the, left, the right side of his face with my left hand, and my inward elbow is going to come across the lower side of his left jaw. This is called a sandwich. At this point, he's going to drop at my feet, and I'm going to cover out. This is a very, very, very aggressive self-defense technique. Went out, Mr. Davis. How are you, sir? He's grabbing me here by my head, and he's going to drive his knee into my face. So as I step in, right off the bat, after I've hit him in the groin, I'm going to get this arm out of my face. I crush the groin and get him off me driving that elbow up. I push down and I strike with that heel palm and elbow across the jaw. Going back up, so let's take it from a different angle. Actually, from a little bit over this way, that's good. So he grabs, in comes the knee, I strike. At this point, as I crush, I can even use his arm to pull down into that elbow shot. I'm then going to push down. Strike with the heel palm, the elbow is going to catch the jaw. At this point, I've got a nice universal cover in myself, and then I cover out to my zone of sanctuary. Pull back up, sir. Once more. So he grabs, in comes the knee, groin, elbow, push down, step, and cover. Back up. Let's take it a little bit faster. So he grabs, 
So as Chris grabs, I'm going to utilize borrowed force of him pulling me forward. And the motion of him pulling me forward, he drives the knee toward me, and I move it out of the way, and I strike him in the groin. At this point, he grabs his groin and goes to bend over. Trying not to let him grab what hurts, I turn my hand to the monkey hand, crush, and I drive the elbow into the solar plexus, striking him into the chin. At this point, if I hit him into the chin, he's going to want to fall backward, so I've got to push down very quickly, like quarter beat time and bringing him forward. Strike with the heel palm right here on the ear, boxing this ear, hitting the hinge of the jaw. And I'm going to strike the other side of the jaw, which we call a sandwich. So this hits, pop, and then followed by the elbow. At this point, when I'm done, if you notice, I have a nice universal checking him off. If I want to continue fighting in various ways, it's all possible. And then I'm going to cover out to a zone of sanctuary. Lone kimono is our next one. Lone, like left one arm kimono grab, and like left one arm grab to your uniform. So as the person is grabbing the uniform, our left hand is coming up, trapping the hand, and I like to strike the hand as I trap the hand, rolling the hand over so their arm is palm up. When I step back, getting a good break on the arm, I'm then going to clear the arm, and deliver my chop to the throat, checking the arm, and cover out. It is key essential on the first move. That when you're grabbed, your first move when you're stepping back, you're dropping your height when you step back and break that arm. Get a good clean break. Clear it, chop, and cover. Put out here, Mr. Davis, and give me a hand with this one. Mr. Davis grabbing with his left hand, so once again I'm stepping back, stretching him out and getting a good break on that arm. When he's grabbing, striking, rolling it over. When this rolls here on this part, it's like I'm rolling the arm, so I expose this right here, and the elbow is going to cause that bone to shoot right out of this with the break. This is going to be nasty. So as I step back and I get that good clean break, I don't want to come around and jam that bone in my arm this way, striking down on the arm. So you want to strike so you clear it, and then move in on your chop to the throat. Come on back up, sir. Let's do it again. So I strike, break. Clear, chop, and cover. Let's do it again. A different angle. Grabs, stretch, break, clear, chop, and cover. Come on back up. He grabs, break, clear, chop, and cover. Come on back up. Once again, real slow. So I roll the hand, and that cancels the other arm. He's still, if I didn't get a break, I'm going to want to load up to hit me. So if I didn't get a break and he's loading up that hand, it's important that I turned his body right here. I've got it checked off with the leg, the arm, and this is going to hit it. If I can't get the throat, I can always take the face. Sometimes you've got to take what you can get. Thank you, sir.